Hello everybody and uh, welcome to this webinar on vehicle lightweight in uh, rivets, joints and composites. Uh, my name is Paul Roberts, as Keith said, and I'm the product manager for Encode Design Life. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. In this webinar we're going to be looking at some of the issues around vehicle lightweighting and we'll be looking at how these impact durability and what we can do with an Encode Design Life to, ad to address some of these issues. And then after that, the final section covers what Encode Design Life can do to address some of the challenges, particularly in terms of new materials and joining technologies. So as engineers, we're being asked to do things that we've not been asked, asked to do before, at least, or at least not to the same degree uh, as is demanded now. For example, uh, you may be asked to uh, save 35% weight of the body and chassis at the vehicle or maybe to have a target to reduce the total weight of the vehicle by 400 kilograms or maybe to look at new materials say uh, magnesium or composite for example for for uh, chassis or suspension members while all the time maintaining durability and minimizing the risk associated with new materials processes and suppliers these figures are showing a real OEM uh, target figures and typical numbers we see throughout the automotive industry. So what are the business drivers for these uh, requirements? Well, in a word, it's uh, generally regulations. So fuel economy, green issues, uh, are all requiring significant reductions in CO2 emissions. And it just and this shows uh, on this slide a trend in all the economy fuel economy regulations you see throughout the world, all heading downwards. As it's not always com easy to compare these regulations like for like, but the main point is that there are major changes in the amount of CO the CO2 targets, and uh, particularly in the next 10 years, the equivalent number people quote in the states, for example, is. Uh, quoting a target of 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025. So, uh, so how do we do that? We're not going to achieve any, any of these major targets in fuel economy with small changes to the vehicle. So we're going to have to do something more significant. And certainly new powertrains are part of that solution. So the move to electric and hybrid vehicles is going to continue and, and will certainly help in, in that regard. But lightweight vehicles will always help. For example, uh, a 10% reduction in vehicle weight gives about a 7% improvement in, in, in economy. And also for electric vehicles, for example, reducing the weight, also reducing the greater range, so you get a, a benefit in that way as well. So not only useful for petrol vehicles, but also for uh, electric and hybrids. And if you look at this, you, you get what's called the virtual circuit virtuous circle at this point. So reducing the weight of the vehicle can give you, lead to reduced suspension loads. So in that pose, once you get reduced loads, you can then look at reducing the size of those components and maybe redesign them with it based on the reduced loads. And there again can give you reduced weight. So if you get into this process, it can give you very large benefits in terms of light weighting. And the light weighting itself will certainly be a major benefit towards uh, CO2 emissions control. So why vehicle lightweight? Does that require major changes to the vehicle to reduce the match by that, by that much? Um, particularly if you look at the body structure, this can make up to about 40% of a typical vehicle match when, mass when including the closures and glazing. So what can you do? For instance, you could look at changing the material. And, look at, and we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a few minutes. But any changes you make may also require vehicle architecture changes to accommodate these. For example, it may not be possible to directly substitute, uh, for example, aluminium for steel in the body panels because the materials reduced stiffness may require increased section size, may include des different designs of the panel support. 
to maintain the overall structural stiffness and crash targets. And also the change in architecture in terms of powertrains also presents challenges and some opportunities in terms of the vehicle, vehicle changes. For any changes made, we need to ensure that the vehicle's functional performance is maintained and durability is key to this. One thing we need to think about is, uh, are the targets still valid with these changes as well? Are the design specs relevant with, with gross changes to the vehicle? Are the load spectra used with major weight changes still okay? Are vibration specifications with, uh, uh, correct with different vehicle powertrains? So these changes can impact not only the material itself and the weight of the vehicle, but also how it's tested and the specifications you need in order to test it correctly. All need to be considered when making major changes as part of the vehicle target setting process for durability. And of course, there are all the other functional targets. So crash, crash and safety, stiffness, noise and vibration. In order to do this, we need more upfront simulation. Also an opportunity for optimization to achieve these goals. And where there are gaps in what can simulate relevant parties also need to partner more, more than to enable the simulation so that performance trade-offs can be assessed much earlier in the design process. So in terms of optimization, look at geometry, shape, thickness, materials. So that's a brief summary of uh, the issues around vehicle lightweight and what, and what it's driving it and the impacts. Now let's look at one of the key enablers to that, which is the challenge of material selection. One of the main trade, uh, one of the main things we look at material selection at the moment is now looking at the comparison between steel and aluminium and its potential for vehicle uh, light weighting in the industry. So let's start with steel. Uh, the use of ice strength steel has increased greatly in the last few years and now over a fifth of the steel used in the industry today is, uh, is ice strength. In order to reach the targets we have, we will need to look at new advanced ice strength steels. These are steels where, with greater formability and can therefore be used in more areas of the structure allowing thinner gauges to be utilised. And this gives a benefit in lightweight, but also allows maintenance of the required crash, durability and strength performance. And also, this, this can give projected targets of weight settings up to 25 to 30%. So getting us some way towards the targets we need to, need to reach. And the big advantage of this is it's familiar low cost material with the use of current manufacturing techniques and also the same aftermarket repair facilities can be used. So cost is good, packaging is good and the existing infrastructure still works. Disadvantage, well, may, is it enough saving? So it's 25 to 30% you can get from this enough. And issues with adjoining strength need to be think, thought about. So you're using very high strength steel, smaller gauges, and these, these panels still need to be joined. So we still need to look at considering the welding of that, the fatigue performance of the welding. And care must be taken to keep the durability of welded joints uh, within the right range for these new steels. But there is much opportunity to optimise gauge thicknesses. So again, more CAE required to assess this. So let's look at aluminium. Aluminium is already widely used uh, in the automotive industry, for example, engine blocks and wheels and, and quite a lot of components, and has a percent potential for body weight savings up to about 40%. Some disadvantages of though, it's, it's more expensive. Spot where joining techniques are, uh, have to be considered more carefully because spot welding aluminium is very difficult, though it can be possible, not normally the uh, preferred method. And there's packaging and architecture requirements around the, uh, the less stiff material that needs to be looked at. But it does have an increase in role in both body and suspension components. And here again, simulation of the joints is very important. So we're moving to, maybe moving to new jointing technology like self-piercing rivets, where they haven't been analyzed in the same way before. So we're moving to new technologies and also lighter weights all at the same time. So a lot of concentration on simulating those joints. 
Let's look at composites. So another, another material being looked at quite a lot is uh, composites. We have a quick look at the three uh, major types being used in the industry today. So short fiber reinforced injection molded material. So this is very short fiber injectable. Uh, different uh, polyamides, polypropylenes, for example, with very short fibers and typical glass fills of 30 50 percent. So lots of non-structural components initially and then moving to structural, but applications in, in automotive interiors. And also long discontinuous fiber materials like sheet molded compound. So this is typically longer, long length uh, uh, fibers, glass or carbon with a thermoplastic or thermoset uh, matrix. Uh, this used again already in, uh, in semi-structural components in, in a lot of automotive vehicles. And thirdly, uh, carbon fiber laminates. So this is using continuous fibers, either unidirectional or woven materials. Good control of the layup so you can build lots of different materials to suit the component. With classically a epoxy matrix, but increasingly interest in, in thermoplastic. So advantage of this, great, much greater strength. Already used in low volume in aerospace and some niche automotive areas, but uh, not uh, this advantage is high cost, which has prevented its use in the automotive industry so far, and also difficult to assembly and manufacturing. So the advantage, carbon fibre offers body structure weight savings up to 60%, so quite a lot of saving can be had. Also gives you possibility of part consolidation and use of new concepts, maybe reduction in part can. So you can look at uh, radic more radical component uh, designs based on that the stronger uh, material. So that may give some advantages in that. Disadvantages cost, carbon fibre especially very expensive. Production cycle times are quite long, so there's curing time, so in terms of a manufacturing cycle can be quite prohibitive. And there's also the, uh, lear the uh, learning curve for engineers to utilize these materials and materials they haven't used typically in those applications before. But there is increasing interest for structural applications. And one of the other disadvantages modes is durability simulation is a major challenge on, on these materials due to the complex nature of the material. and uh, and all the complications involved with that. So if we look at that in a bit more detail, and fatigue of composites and why it's challenging. Well, several things, several different areas. Multiple damage mechanisms are, are possible. So fiber failure themselves, the matrix can crack, the fibers can pull out, it can delaminate. So a multitude of different failure mechanisms. These failures can be initiated at uh, the ply drop-offs, for example, edges of the component. Uh, for manufacturing defects and also from impact damage, typically on the, you see on the wind turbines you get lots of wind impact damage and that can be a so initiation sites for failure. And also the damage may be diffuse and progressive. So it's not like a steel where typically you have a crack that grows quite quickly and you get significant damage and breakage. Uh, with composite materials you can get uh, cracking in the component at a certain level, this may reduce the stiffness of the component, then, then that damage may spread, get to lower stressed areas, and it may survive for quite a long while. And it may be just stiffness changes that you notice and not, not failure for a very long while. And also the material itself is uh, inhomogeneous, so it's got different properties and different parts of the material. In effect, it's a material created as you manufacture it in different parts, just the, the structure. It's also anisotropic in that the, material, the properties vary in different directions. So it's dependent on the ply uh, directions and also the, the amount of fill. And it's also temperature and environmentally sensitive. So it's affected by temperature quite a bit more than uh, steel materials. And in the normal range you may use them, it's affected by the temperature. And also things like humidity have quite a large effect. This is an area currently in terms of composites and uh, that uh, we're investing quite a lot of effort in at the moment, partnering with uh, quite, a, com quite a range of uh, companies in different industries and also different uh, project, government-sponsored projects, looking for practical solutions to help uh, simulate fatigue earlier in the design process for these materials. But it's still a challenge and I'll, we'll cover a bit some of the things we've done so far later. 
So one of the other things that you might consider uh, is not just changing materials, in particular materials, but, all, but uh, looking at multiple materials. And this is more, using multiple materials is likely to be uh, the way you go with, multi, with uh, vehicle structures. This is an example of uh, the multi-material lightweight vehicle project uh, where they had a reduced weight of 23% from the change of materials. The advantage with this is you can uh, pick the material with the right strength requirements for the particular area where it's required. So you can use the high strength materials where you need them, low strength materials we can get away with it. So you can target the right performance in the right areas, which gives you some significant advantages. The disadvantage is you're now joining dissimilar materials, which can be a challenge. So that in, so that's led to the use of things like self-piercing rivets and a lot more use of adhesive which uh, I'll cover later in terms of what we can do towards that analysis. So how can NKEL help in, in this area of vehicle lightweighting and joining technologies? So first I'll look at some of the general features uh, in ENCO Design Life and then move on to more specific advanced uh, solvers in there. So, ENCODE Design Life uh, enables fatigue prediction from finite element simulations. It supports well proven methods such as strain life, stress life, accounting for all the things you'd expect like mean stress and temperature and plasticity and stress gradients, and supports for all the major FE analysis codes that most people use uh, within the industry. It also has many advanced uh, tech capabilities, including the fatigue of seam welds, spot welds, composites, multi-axle analysis, vibration, custom analysis. So lots of, uh, lots of advanced technology built in. It's also ideally uh, utilized for optimization. So as, as part of uh, vehicle light weighting, numerical optimization can be used quite a lot to look at the uh, multiple targets that you need to hit in terms of durability and stiffness and, and other targets. And design life can be used, for, is fully batchable, uh, it can be used for fatigue simulation as part of an optimization process and they're used by customers within a range of uh, different uh, optimization processes and tools. Most, uh, all of the major optimization tools looking at the effects of shape and thickness on durability. As part of optimization, it can be necessary to run many different analyses. Therefore, it requires fast turnaround of results in order for the optimization process to be practical. And one way which Design Lives enables is fast runtime is by supporting parallel processing, multi-threaded, and also computing in HPC environments. So fully supporting uh, clustered analysis. And uh, near, near linear scaling is possible because of the way the analysis works. So it allows you to break the process up in terms of different entities across the different processes and get really good scaling in terms of analysis time. And uses all the stand, standard uh, industry MPI functionality to uh, do the distributed processing, depending on what pro, uh, system you're running on. So it can be faster. You can run it fast enough to be able to use a practical optimization tool within an optimization process. So that's a little bit of detail there, uh, ENCODE uh, Design Life can help uh, in terms of composites and especially solving options that are available to look at composite materials. So the first solve we'll look at is the short fiber composite analysis in ENCODE Design Life. This uses a stress live approach and is typically used for glass fiber filled thermoplastics. It takes a stress tensor from each layer and section integration point through the thickness is read from the FE results. The material orientation tensor describing the fiber share and directions. Each calculation point is uh, provided by a from a manufacturing simulation and mapped directly to the FE model. And it includes two different material methods. Uh, one using multiple SN curves, which are derived from test specimens taken in the different orientations or a direct connection to uh, Digimat, where we can call out and get uh, Digimat SN curves for the particular 
orientation of that particular entity and stress distribution you've got. That's the main solver for short fibre composites. We also have a preview solver in the software for short fibre composites using a strain energy approach. This is a additional approach, uh, additional approach looking at reducing the complexity of the, not just the calculation, but the testing process required to generate the uh, life data for the component. So it's a calculated from product of stress and strain, adjusted for mean stress, uses a simple power law relationship for the uh, life from the strain energy, and this greatly simplifies the material data requirements. So your testing of your components will be uh, a lot easier. And currently this is in, uh, there's a significant amount of testing work going on both in our own laboratories and uh, with a couple of customer projects where we're looking at validating this particular model. So currently in preview mode and currently uh, being validated at the moment. One of the things we've done in design life over the last uh, few versions is to ex greatly extend the use of the vibration, vibration loading within all the solvers. So uh, initially vibration loads were only available for SN analysis a long while ago and these were brought in in terms of direct frequency response function from the FE or by bringing in the modal stress and modal participations for the, so, so the FRF can be calculated. Just the, the second one, the preferred method is probably modal stress, really reduces the size of the uh, finite element results file, makes the analysis quicker and allows you to give better stress, much better stress resolution than you can get from the FRF without the downside of a large FE results model. And over the last few versions, we've extended this vibration load type now to include PSD, sign dwell, sign sweep, sign on random and multiple PSDs. So the loading type's gone up and also extended that now to all as many of the different solver types as we can. So now you can do strain life analysis, with vibration loads, also seam welds, spot welds, and also into the short fiber composite engine. So now you're available, it's available to do vibration loading on composite components made from short fiber composites. We've also extended to the custom, custom method, so we've extended the custom analysis quite a bit, so you can use vibration loading into that. And the latest functionality we're looking at in terms of uh, short fiber composites and vibration is looking at 3D stress tensors from the vibration for short fibre composites and I'll cover this in a bit more detail in a minute. The motivation for putting the vibration analysis within short fibre composites is uh, in terms of components and structures that must be divined to derive random loadings, more of these are being looked at in terms of making them out of composite materials. So things like uh, you're looking at their mounts, uh, radiator structures, lots of the components that now have vibration loads are being looked at in terms of composites. And some of these include composites in both short and long and continuous fibres. In terms of the FE base calculations, it's pretty much the same process we use within material and metals. So FE is used to define the transfer function and brought in either in terms of the FRF or modally to try them gets you the stress that drives the damage. Rain flow counting is still used to identify the damage in process um, and this process is well established for methods and we're now looking at how to extend that for composite materials with random loading. Some of the challenges that we looked at earlier, so all the same different failure mechanisms, manufacturing processes, failure initiation sites, and also at the bottom there, multi-axle stresses arrive from layer interactions, you've now got the possibility with multiple layers that you will have multi-axial stresses, 3D stress tensors you've now got to look at. So how much can we simplify this and get a sensible result? It shows you a schematic of the, uh, the modelling approach we take. So a lot of manufacturing simulation to get the, the microstructure correct, the standard analysis in terms of fatigue coupons to generate SN curves at different orientations or directly from uh, from Digimat, and then a combination of the fatigue model and the fatigue simulation within design within design life, pulling in the structural FE results 
the SN calculations and the microstructure directly. As I said, layer interactions now can result in multi-axial stresses. Stresses are most often nearly proportional. This allows us to uh, to approximate the uh, result, the, the allowable stress by uh, approximating as a scalar time history and a normalized stress tensor. And, the separate, and then we separate the material modeling and cycle count and damage calculations. And in this entire process, the multi-axis assessment is an important part of that process. The multi-axial assessment technique we use in terms of 2D, uh, we take the stress tensor history and we uh, look at that in terms of a cloud plot in 3D space of the tensor. The portion of proportional loading, these points all then would fall on a straight line through the origin. And we have a method based on the principal moments of inertia of this data cloud that allows to determine the average stress state and a measure of the non-proportionality based on the aspect ratio of the cloud. So this uh, allows us to uh, look at the look at the multi-axiality of the stress in terms of the 2D stress tensor. Excuse me. And then the general process then is look at uh, the random time process is represented generally by a PSD. The statistics of that time domain process can be estimated from the PSD shape. The shape is generally characterized by the spectral moments and then those are used to generate a probability density function of the stress ranges using different estimation techniques built into the software. Also in that you can estimate the probable return time to exceed UTS or the probable maximum stress in a particular time. Now have we extended this to composites? Well we now need to look at 3D stresses. So the math now to be extended to, to a six dimensional plot in space. We define the complex stress strain response and this probabilistic approach leads to a 6D analog of the moment of inertia plot. As you can understand, we haven't got a plot of that. The, uh, the complex eigenvalue solution is then carried out on that 3D stress and then we generate the PSD in the same, in the same way as we do for the 2D. So this has allowed us to do three, full 3D stress analysis of a short fiber composite engine. This can also be applied to continuous fiber composites. I'll show you a bit later about the static fairly criteria engine, but we've also added the 3D stress evaluation to that as well. So if you look at the uh, continuous fiber, for example, if you look at this, uh, a large, long stress, large stress in the 1-1 one, one direction might be much less important than a smaller stress in the across direction where you get uh, less strength in the material. So it's used now within all the frequency, dom the frequency domain analysis can be used in all the different uh, static failure criteria in that, that engine. Let's run through a quick application example. So this is uh, part of some work that we're working with a couple of customers on and this has been presented in the, in, uh, the recent NAFEMS conference. So this was a uh, coupon machine from injected mould in plaque, uh, glass fibre filled. It's got some mass added to the end to change the uh, uh, first mode frequency so we can work uh, at the frequency we want to work at. And we measured rig responses, monitor accelerometers and then ran this to failure. And then simulated that as well. So that shows the overall process for that. Uh, the component frequency response function carried out in, an, uh, in ANSYS. The elastic stiffness matrices were calculated for each layer based on the orientations within Digimat and put and use that in ANSYS. Uh, one, one thing you always need to take care of, the damping was adjusted based on test data so the particular component 
we uh, analysed the damping of that from test data using GlyphWorks, the uh, Vibesys modal uh, analysis option to look at what the damping was actually was in the component because with all these uh, dynamic structures, damping is, uh, is something you have to consider quite carefully uh, and has a vast effect, a very large effect on the material, a very large effect on the So that has a large effect on the uh, durability. Let me just show you a quick example of that process. So this is that analysis process where we have the, uh, in this case, the we have the modal results in terms of the stress on that component. We're combining that with the uh, material and using the vibration solver within short fiber composite engine to calculate the probability density function of the stress ranges and then from that the damage for all the parts in that component. So in that case we now have results in terms of damage for the multiple layer solid uh, elements within that component. We look at how that correlation is going with test at the moment. The, uh, it's a good prediction of the frequency response function. Failure locations have all come out correctly. And the fatigue re uh, prediction is uh, reasonable. It's conservative. But considering the assumption we've made, there's a linear assumption in there as well. There's, there's issues with self-eating and strain range effects when you're running uh, quite fast vibration on the component. So uh, considering that, it's quite a good simulation so far and we're quite encouraged by the results. And we're using this currently to validate both the short fibre solver and the, uh, the strain energy approach. Now the second solver we have for composites, so the third solver we have for composites within ENCO Design Life is looking at composite static failure criteria. So this is different to the short fibre analysis. It uses a simple safety factor approach based on industry standard static failure criteria. criteria. Uh, so typically these are the criteria that you already have in your FE uh, codes that you can already calculate, so which apply to both unidirectional and woven composites. But these uh, are now within design life. They can be applied to uh, your large duty cycle, for example, of all your loads. So you're not just looking at these in terms of a single load, but over the load variation you've got as a in component. So you can have a big, big advantage that you can use this for your complete load history or complete duty cycles. Uh, also, we've added the custom method to this, so you can also define your own custom method within Python for static value criteria. It's included two new glyphs and also new worked examples to go with that to show how it, uh, to, to utilise that, it, both the main method and also the custom method in the worked example. So that includes uh, all the stress, there are 14 different uh, static failure criteria for, and then and you can use the tool as a single one of these, so if you have a preferred failure criteria you want to analyse, you can do that, or you can uh, pick any range of those or all of them and then look at all of them together. The main reason for doing these uh, multiple ones is there's no real consensus in the industry as to which is the most applicable and they all appear to be different, applicable to different materials and different uh, uh, things that people like to run, so we give them as much choice as we can in terms of which ones you might want to run. So that engine is see here we have a static failure analysis. You can pick a single failure envelope or conservative based on multiples, and you can pick the multiple criteria or select which criteria you want so you can pick any number of these materials and turn them on and off so you can do one or none or custom. 
So you can have defined custom methods. And this gives you a safety factor on the component to based on that failure criteria. Um, one of the things we're doing at the moment, uh, concentrating quite a lot on, uh, on composite developments. We have uh, our own technology group as a major fo focus on composites. That's including method development and validation of those methods. And uh, also we have our own advanced materials characterization and testing facility here in the UK, our own test lab. And that's carrying out internal technology validation, so testing to support the technology group. And also we've got a large number of cooperative projects with external customers where testing is either being carried out here or on the customer sites where we're looking at different methods both in terms of uh, the short fibre composites and also long continuous fibres. And along with that, we also partner with all the major CAE vendors to maximise the inter interoperability and keep us solver neutral as we can with all the different solvers. So let's move now on to looking at joining technologies and that are most relevant to the analysis of new lightweight structures. One of those is adhesive bonds. So there's an adhesive bond solved within ANCO Design Life used, which uses a fracture mechanics method to assess joints in terms of structure that are most critically loaded. So we have a particular modeling technique currently using uh, shells joined by beams. There's some scope to change this. You could have it be a, a joined by solids, but currently you need the beams to trigger the analysis. So we're cur there's currently a bit of work going on in the background to look at where we, uh, whether we should use different modeling techniques for this, but they're easier to model. There's quite a simple technique used at the moment. We use the force of the moment, line force of the moment at the edge of that glued flange. Calculate the strain energy using the equivalent J integral made at the edge of the adhesive bond to calculate a safety factor to when that glue would start to crack or whether it would crack. There's quite a lot of information on that in a, a, a SAE paper that was given in uh, 2012. It's described in detail there. So typically the way that gets used, we we'll look at the uh, application example here. It's an example, application example using an aluminium uh, joint body structure but with self-piercing rivets but also combines the use of, of uh, adhesive bonds on some sections of that structure. And in that case the way that generally is modelled is generally it's applicable that the adhesive bond if it's there will be the thing that carries the load. So typically the that body structure would be modelled with the adhesive bonds in and not with the self-piercing rivets. The analysis would then be run in that state and then the assessment would be made as to whether that glue would fail at all, how big the safety factor was and whether that was acceptable. If that became to an unacceptable level and we would then assume that the glue disappeared and calculate the same model again but with the rivets carrying the load in the areas where we think the adhesive bond would fail. So a two-pass analysis and another analysis required in terms of the FE if necessary. So as I said, this uh, looks at the, one of the other components, self-piercing rivets. This is a, a joining technology being used quite a lot when looking at aluminium body structures, uh, more applicable to aluminium than uh, spot welding would be. Uh, this work here I'm showing here was done as part of a cooperative UK government project. Uh, which we were involved with, with uh, Jaguar Land Rover. And they were initially looking at seeing whether they could use the spot weld method and uh, material calculation possibilities in spot weld to calculate ri rivet life. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me a second. So uh, we, there was quite a lot of test work done on that, uh, looking at different combinations of sheet thickness, uh, load amplitude, and looking at lap shear joints in coach, coach field test specimens. 
And in terms of the results, you can see the marked difference there if you just use the standard uh, spot weld approach uh, with not before the two, it was optimized looking at the forces uh, to life. You can see quite a lot of scatter and two distinct areas between the different uh, test sample types. Uh, what, what was then carried out in the project was optimising this approach to adjust the model parameters to get a better fatigue prediction for riveted joints. So an optimisation process on all the results to see how we could optimise this to collapse all the data points onto a single curve. That shows the overall result for that. So this is exactly the same test data collapsed using that method onto a single curve to give now a, in effect, spot weld material set that uh, quite accurately predicts the uh, self-piercing rivet life. So as I said earlier, now the, uh, that, that is now being used in the uh, analysis of the body in white, looking at adhesive joints using the adhesive method and discrete joints using the uh, self-piercing rivet method, and then a combination of these two to get overall results for the uh, body structure. Overall analysis process again, fatigue solver using the joint parameters for uh, for uh, the self-piercing rivets. A normal sort of analysis in terms of the FE and pulling in time history loads for that. And that SPR data generated from that project is now part of the ENCODE uh, standard database. So there's a material set in there for self-piercing rivets. And in general, this, this database now carries, up, I think, about 400 different data sets and is also complemented by a, a second premium material database that uh, is available through the Princeira Access Licensing System, which now has about one, over 100 data sets. And those are all things that we've measured in our own test lab, so not published data or data we've got from any other source, but ones we know where it's come from with uh, good provenance on that data. The other thing that may be useful in terms of uh, joining technologies is the custom methodology that is built into Design Life. So there has always been a custom combination and analysis method within the spot weld analysis engine. So this has been used in, in some areas to look at other single point joint, jointing methods using the uh, methodology to bring the forces in in the same way as spot weld, but then using custom code to do whatever analysis the user wants. So typically for bolts, for example, it's been used for doing bolt analysis. And recently we've also added custom analysis engine within Design Life Base, separate from Spot World. And this opens the system even further for custom combinations in terms of method and fatigue analysis algorithms and different cycle counting methods. So we've basically opened up the entire process in terms of stress combination, uh, cycle counting method and the final analysis method. And to help in the use of that, also added two new worked examples on custom analysis. And as I said earlier, this also includes the vibration load solver. As I said, can be used for bolts. Been used quite extensively for other single point methods. And for bolt, for example, you can use a custom combination method in the spot weld engine. So you can use that to kind of go from your forces to the specific loads that are relevant to bolts. You can also, in the standard material database, and any different custom material properties you want for any material type, and then you can pull that into any of the custom engines to do analysis from that. Now, in this, this most of the people using this for bolts, this is not really a full bolt calculation. This is more of a, a check to see whether the, these areas of bolts are ones you should be worried about. Because this is generally based on a shell structure with beams, you can't do a full bolt analysis of that, but it's using the beam forces to give some estimate of whether that analysis, whether the forces in that those beams would cause problems with a bolted joint. So basically a filter process using the forces to see whether you then need to do any more analysis. So use this as a coarse filter and then look in more detail about those beams. So maybe you reduce the number of bolt joints you need to look at in terms of in detail. A quick example of that. So that uh, is this is showing a custom spot weld method for doing uh, analysis of bolts. So this is a very simple test model where I've, we've multiple beam elements going through 
Let's have a look at the elements. So we have multiple beam elements going through the model, connecting multiple sheets, bolting those sheets together. And then we have a done a custom analysis to get the forces out of that, and then do an assessment of a number of different processes. So look at maximum force, torsion on there, and any analysis process you might want to do to give you a, a filter to know whether those bolts would survive. So in conclusion, vehicle lightweighting is definitely needed. It's, it's something we all need to work on. Material, material selection is a challenge, not just classical materials, but also composite materials give us a, a, quite a large channel challenge. And ENCODE can help. As you can see, durability is in, can be included in optimization, can be used to assess the strength of welds and other joining technologies, and also in the development of new methods for the fatigue of composites and other m m new materials. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, oh, one thing I, sh I should mention, the cooperative project that was run in the UK uh, was the bonded car project, and that is the uh, relevant information on that. And more information can be obtained from that. There's also quite a few technical papers that have been published on that.